So um, good morning, everyone, or sorry, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming to our presentation. Our product is a recyclable nano composite for water purification. My name is Anjali Gopal. And I'm Stuart Lindley. Uh, Dushan Sivaratnam and Robert David Evans are out in the hall uh, dealing with the poster presentations right now. Today, we're going to go over the motivation behind why our product was designed. Uh, we're going to go over some of the customer requirements from the perspective of the oil industry. Uh, then we're going to talk about the actual physical design of our nanocomposite, uh, talk about the synthesis a little bit, and then finally we'll go over some results and discussion uh, before addressing how did we meet our customer requirements. So when you take a look at a lot of chemical manufacturing industries, and here we're talking about the oil industry, for instance, or the pulp and paper processing industry, um, a large concern is the enormous amount of aqueous waste that's often produced, and uh, this waste is often teeming with organic contaminants. So in the oil industry, for instance, it's estimated that for every one barrel of oil that's produced, you get about 10 barrels of aqueous waste that's produced as a byproduct. And you can't just dump this aqueous waste back into the environment. So as a result, what you get are these huge distillation centers. So this is a picture of the distillation center in South Dakota, where it's estimated that in 2013, they produced about 1 million barrels of oil each day, which accounts for 10 million barrels of aqueous waste each day. And in fact, worldwide, it's estimated that we produce about 70 billion barrels of aqueous waste um, in one year. And in the US um, alone, this equates to about 200 million barrels a day, which is enough water to flow over the Niagara Falls for three months. So you can see the magnitude of this problem and why it's so important to come up with an effective way to treat wastewater. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of effective solutions right now. So the solutions that we have aren't very safe or economical. And that's something that we wanted to address when we were creating our technology. Uh, so when looking at a product, uh, speci uh, specifically for the oil production industry, we really, want, we really wanted to take a look at the customer requirements from their perspective. So what's the most important to industry? Well, first is reducing the contaminant levels below the United States Environmental Protection Agency standards. Uh, for this presentation and for this project, we're specifically looking at BTEX compounds. BTEX is an acronym that stands for benzenes, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes. These are some really hazardous carcinogenic materials that are ubiquitous within wastewater. These are the contaminants that we need to remove before we can discharge them to the environment. And so our primary requirement, the most important one, is reducing the contaminant levels to a safe level as determined by the US EPA. Secondly, uh, also in relation to discharging the water to the environment, we need to make sure that whatever solution we come up with, if we're using a nanomaterial solution, we need to make sure that all, the, uh, all of the nanomaterial is recovered after treatment. We can't throw in our nanomaterials, treat the water, and then expel nanomaterials to the environment. We need to make sure that everything is recovered within the single um, testing protocol. And our final customer requirement, always relevant to industry, is what is the cost of this solution? We need to make sure that our treatment mechanism is on par or below the cost of the current standards. Of course, currently the standard is distillation, which is extremely expensive, boiling large quantities of water. Uh, but if we're going to use um, titanium dioxide photocatalysis, which is our mechanism, we need to make sure that our product is either on par or below the cost of using just native titanium dioxide for treating volumes of water. So I'd mentioned titanium dioxide photocatalysis. This is a method by which we're going to address uh, these contaminants. How does it work? Titanium dioxide is, an or is a semiconductor material. You can throw it into water, and then you irradiate it with ultraviolet light. What this is going to do is it's going to produce oxidative radical species in water. Uh, these are highly reactive species that are going to interact with our organic contaminants. Essentially, oxygen is just going to be continually added to these molecules until the final product are carbon dioxide and water. So we're taking a very complex organic molecule and breaking it down to very simple constituents that are benign and completely chemically inert, so very safe to release to the environment. But if titanium dioxide photocatalysis is such a promising uh, method for treating these kinds of contaminants, why is it not currently used more prevalently within industry? So Titanium dioxide is really great when it's in a nanoparticle slurry. So this basically means that you have titanium dioxide that's uh, suspended really, really well in water. And the reason that this is so important is because this increases the surface area of um, the reaction so that oxidative photocatalysis can occur more readily. However, 
The problem is, imagine you have a barrel of water and then you throw in a whole bunch of titanium dioxide and it purifies all the organic contaminants. That's great. Now what do you do with the titanium dioxide? You need some way to remove it from the barrel because otherwise we're just introducing our own contaminants. And this is the problem that we want to address. It's really difficult to remove titanium dioxide in traditional methods. So you might think, hey, you know, why don't we use a filter? But when we're lo looking at titanium dioxide nanoparticles, these are particles that are 25 nanometers in diameter. So it's really hard to remove these by filtration. In a lab, you can do it by centrifugation, but we're not going to centrifuge 10 million barrels of aqueous waste every day. So we really need an effective method to recover this titanium dioxide. And what's our solution to that? We're using magnetic nanoparticles. So in particular, we're using iron oxide nanoparticles. Iron oxide nanoparticles have a lot of interesting properties. So um, they have a quick separation time and they have low aggregation, which means it, it actually won't interfere with the titanium dioxide reaction kinetics. Um, as well, the most important thing is that these are actually magnetic. So when you perform your wastewater treatment, once the treatment is complete, you can apply a really strong magnetic field and recover all of your nanocomposite. However, to do this, we need a third component, and in this case, that's graphene. So graphene is what holds the titanium dioxide together with the iron oxide. So graphene is really important for structural support and for mechanical properties. Graphene is also resistant to photocatalysis, so it can't be harmed by the titanium dioxide. And finally, graphene is also really interesting because it has a lot of unique electrochemical properties that actually improve the effectiveness of the photocatalysis reaction. So overall, this is just adding to the effectiveness of our composite. Uh, so now you know what the major components of our design are. We're going to show you how we put them all together. So as Andrew mentioned, the three components are titanium dioxide. That's our active material, our photocatalyst. We got our iron oxide nanoparticles. That's also an active material. That's uh, the way we're going to be able to separate our nanocomposite from solution after treatment. And we've got graphene, which binds them all together. So I'm going to go over the magnetic core synthesis first. Essentially, all we did here is co-precipitated an iron salt in an aqueous medium. We used a chelating agent, that's sodium citrate. And we also used a polymer, polyacrylamide heat the whole suspension up to about 180 degrees for uh, 12 hours, and you're going to form iron oxide nanoparticles that are held together with the polyacrylamide. So what we've produced here are about 250 nanometer in diameter uh, magnetic particles. They've got a really high magnetic force per particle, so they've got a lot of weight that they can carry with them when you're separating them out from solution. But before we add this into our composite, we need to make sure that it's coated with silica. Why is that important? Well, we need to isolate the iron oxide from the titanium dioxide. As I mentioned, titanium dioxide is going to absorb UV light, and it's going to use that energy to generate radical species to break down the contaminants. But if this energy is transferred from titanium dioxide to the iron oxide instead, this is going to create two problems. Number one, that energy is not going to be used for photocatalysis. It's going to slow down the rate at which you can get rid of your organic contaminants. Secondly, this is going to change the phase of the iron oxide from a magnetite, which is a really strong magnetic iron oxide, to a different phase, such as hematite or maghemite, which are less susceptible magnetic fields. That's going to slow down our separation time. So the silicon dioxide coating is really important to make sure that we're able to maintain good photocatalysis and good magnetic separation. We do this through a simple sole gel stober chemistry. It's technology that's been around since the 60s, and we just create a uniform coating of silicon dioxide around our magnetic particles. The final step is taking all the components and adding them together. We purchased titanium dioxide as P25 nanopowder, which is kind of an industry standard titanium dioxide. And we purchased graphene in the form of graphene oxide. We add these three components, magnetic particles, titanium dioxide, and graphene oxide into a hydrothermal reaction and heat it up to 200 degrees Celsius for about uh, 12 hours. What that does, it's going to induce the formation of covalent oxygenated bridges. We're essentially just doing a condensation reaction to link uh, hydroxyl groups on the titanium dioxide and silicon dioxide surface directly to oxygen groups on the graphene oxide, forming a permanent covalent linkage. This means that we'll be able to withdraw all the nanocomposite, including the titanium dioxide from solution when a magnetic field is applied. The other thing that's really great about this synthesis method is it's modular. It means we can get three different components made at the same time and then combine them in a single step. If we were to code titanium dioxide directly onto the magnetic particle, we'd first have to make the magnetic particle, code it in silicon dioxide, code it in titanium dioxide, 
and then process the titanium dioxide to make sure it's photocatalytically active. That could take a long time. This way, we can make all those components separately and add them together in a single final step, meaning that our process is very scalable, very easy to industrially produce. So now that we have our composite, we want to make sure that it actually works the way that we want it to. So we performed a series of simple characterization tests just to make sure that the composite has the desired properties. So here you can see an SEM image of our composite. So we used a scanning electron microscope to visualize what our composite looks like. And you can see um, the blue that's highlighted is the CSA. So this is the iron oxide aggregate. And this is about 250 nanometers in diameter, which is what we expected. And then you can see that the CSA is actually bond very firmly to the TiO2 coated graphene, and that's in red. And we know for a fact that this is our magnetic composite because before we did this imaging, we washed our composite many times um, in a magnetic solution. So that way, anything that's not magnetic will have been washed away. And anything that remains, we're confident, is actually our composite. The next testing that we did is um, to verify the magnetic separability of the composite. So we took our composite, we put it in solution, we mixed it up, and then we put it near a very strong magnet and let it settle over a period of about 20 minutes. And you can see from these pictures that the separation actually occurs extremely well and that you do get the really clear water at the top with the composite at the bottom near the magnet. Uh, so the other results we're going to show you here today are the actual photo decomposition uh, of uh, the photo decomposition of organic contaminants using our nanocomposite. Uh, in order to assess this, we used methylene blue. That's an organic dye. It's a rather large organic molecule which has a bright blue color. Uh, we can assess its destruction by looking at uh, its color before treatment and after treatment and determining the concentration that's remaining in the solution. Using our nanocomposite, we're able to reduce a concentration of 5 milligrams per liter methylene blue from 100% concentration down to between 90 and 95% degradation uh, within 60 minutes. This is comparable to that of native P25, that's just plain titanium dioxide particles. We compared our composite to plain uh, titanium dioxide on a mass-to-mass -mass basis. Recall that our nanocomposite is made up of iron oxide, silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, and graphene. That means that only about 50% of the composite is actually photoactive material. The fact that our composite is active on the same time scale as plain P25, which is almost double the amount of titanium dioxide, shows that our uh, nanocomposite is really efficient in removing these kinds of organic contaminants from water. We also performed a recyclability study because we need to show that we can recover and reuse our composite. The pink line shows one milligram per liter methylene blue uh, assessed through five different degradation trials. All we do here is we take our composite, add it into methylene blue solution, stir up with a glass rod, and place it under UV lamp. After 30 minutes, we remove the composite from the UV, place it onto a magnet, separate out all the nanocomposite at the bottom of the vial, pour out that solution, and replace it with fresh methylene blue, and then redo the exact same study again. And we do that five times in a row. With the pink line, you can see there is no uh, decrease in photocatalytic effect over five trials. That means that we're confident that none of our titanium dioxide, not a significant amount, is being lost between each trial. Uh, with the other samples, you can see that there is a slight decrease in efficiency, but we think that's due to adsorption of the organic contaminant, occluding reaction sites on the TiO2. Uh, finally, we assessed our product uh, in its ability to degrade contaminants that are specifically rele uh, relevant to the oil production industry. Xylene is a very common solvent used in oil extraction. Uh, we tested it at its solubility limit of about 40 milligrams per liter, and we applied our nanocomposite, and within 15 minutes, we were able to see a de uh, degradation of this material down to about 10 milligrams per liter, which is actually the United States Environmental Protection Agency maximum contaminant level for this compound. So we are able to use our prototype composite to reduce the concentration of a really hazardous organic material from uh, the saturation value down to a value that's almost safe to release to the environment. And we're confident that with multiple trials of our, um, of our nanocomposite, we could reduce this value further. So it's evident that from a lot of the testing and characterization data that we just presented, that our composite does actually meet all of the primary requirements that we set out to meet initially. So again, the 
the biggest primary requirement we tried to meet was the BTEX degradation. And from the xylene degradation study, it's evident that we are able to co almost completely degrade the xylene and especially keep it below that US EPA level. And second of all, um, it is evident that we were able to produce a particle that was magnetically active and as a result will be magnetically separable if we apply it on a large scale basis. However, it's also really interesting to note that we met a lot of our secondary customer requirements as well, and that was really exciting to us. So one of the big issues when we're developing a product for industry is keeping the cost low. And for P25, um, which is native titanium dioxide, the cost is about 14 cents per liter. But with our nano composite, because of the fact that you can reuse the composite for many cycles, we were actually able to reduce this cost down to 5 cents per liter. So that means the industry standard right now is twice as expensive as our composite, which is really, really exciting. And the cost of this treatment, we actually determined using our studies that we did in the lab. And as we showed you, we only tried five different uh, recovery and reuse trials. If we're able to increase the number of trials we can perform using the nanocomposite up to 10, 20, 30, 50, or even 100 uses, the cost for treatment of water per liter is going to be reduced to a fraction of the amount that we calculated here. Uh, so the composite really has the potential to be much more cost effective than native titanium dioxide. Uh, also here I'm going to mention once again the scalability of our synthesis method. It would be very useful for industry. Making three different uh, unique separate products and then combining them in one single end step uh, could reduce the synthesis time and cost of uh, such a production mechanism. So at this time, we'd like to conclude our presentation, and we just wanted to give our gratitude to some of the members who have really shown us support. So Dr. Frank, who, who unfortunately isn't with, with us here today, gave us a lot of support, and we'd really like to thank him for that. And also to the Nanotechnology Engineering Undergraduate Program, we'd really like to thank them for their support as well. And we think one of the really exciting things about being part of new and developing technologies is that we really get to use creative and meaningful solutions to challenging problems, and we hope that our product can really have an impact in the wastewater sector. Thank you very much, and we'd like to open the floor for questions. Right. Uh, we didn't actually test that within this synthesis run. Uh, I think that the best way to do that would probably be uh, elemental analysis, perhaps EDX. Um, within it, it's, it's kind of difficult to determine how much of the mass is actually a magnetic particle versus P25, because within our reaction procedure, once the composite's made, uh, we're throwing it on a magnet and we're washing out anything that's not magnetic. And then recovering, like, a, so we're recovering a fraction of it, and uh, part of the P25 is washed away with each wash, anything that doesn't associate to the graphene oxide. So it's kind of difficult to assess how much of it is actually active material versus um, magnetic material. But that would be one of our concerns yeah, going forward. Question related to the, we use this composite for treating water. Mm -hmm. Have you sort of a chance the particles made by the treatment process will be treated by the water? Right. Water? Yeah. Separate, um, so, so within separate the... Separate so the separate water. Water. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so within our recovery trials, we did show that uh, with the one milligram per liter methylene blue solution, we're able to get consistent degradation without any decrease in efficiency. And we think that if we were leaching significant amounts of titanium dioxide, then we would see a reduction in that, um, in the kind of activity of our composite over each one of those trials. Um, but the only real way to assess that would be do an elemental analysis, and you need to do ICPMS for that, which was kind of a really expensive process for uh, our project. But yeah, going forward, that's something we'd have to really look at. But also, um, the components of the catalyst are titanium dioxide, iron oxide, silicon dioxide, and graphene. Uh, titanium dioxide is currently used in the food industry. I mean, it's used as a milk whitener, it's used as a paste whitener, uh, paint whitener, it's used in toothpaste, it's used in sunscreen, so it's a really benign chemical. It's got an LD50 of 40,000 milligrams per kilogram. So it's an enormous amount of material that would be required for lethal dose. So it's very safe. Silicon dioxide, it's used as a desiccant in the food industry, so that's also really safe uh, for human ingestion. And then iron oxide as well. I mean, magnetite, uh, Fe304, is just rust. So it's, uh, none, none of the components of the catalyst are really hazardous. And they're all in aqueous dispersion, making them even less hazardous. Uh, additionally, um, the size of our composite, 
is on the micro scale. Uh, like the components are nano based, but uh, the composite itself is, you know, a really large particle. Dr. Ben. Okay, yeah. So the particles are actually super paramagnetic. Super paramagnetism is a type of magnetism uh, where the hysteresis is a very short time. So it's a very low relaxation time. It means that the particles return to a state of non-magnetism unless they're in the presence of a magnetic field. Yeah. So when they're in solution, there should be no aggregation of the iron oxide particles because they're not magnetic. But once you place them in a magnetic field, then they're ferromagnetic and they aggregate and they form the transient aggregates and they'll be drawn out of solution. Yeah. Yeah, once you remove the magnetic field, the relaxation time of uh, the magnetic component is very low. So within seconds, it returns to its non-magnetic state. Uh, we didn't confirm this. The only way to confirm it would be through either squid or vibrating scanning magnetometer. But uh, in the papers that we had based our synthesis process off of, uh, they did show the magnetic characterization. And superparamagnetism is one of the properties that they see. Uh, so it's basically just a condensation reaction. So uh, the surface groups of the titanium dioxide is covered in hydroxyl groups, right? Um, and it's the same with silicon dioxide, it's all covered in hydroxyl groups. Graphene oxide is covered in hydroxyl groups, uh, carboxylic acid groups, epoxides, and when we're heating it up to about 200 degrees under high pressure in a hydrothermal vessel, we're basically just forming condensation reactions. So you've got the all groups on the surface of the, sil uh, of the silica and on the surface of the titanium dioxide interacting with oxygen groups on the surface of the graphene oxide and just forming covalent oxygen bridges. Yeah, uh, and as we mentioned, graphene is also really good because it's resistant to photocatalysis and also because it actually aids with the photocatalysis reaction. So we found that, or we think that part of the reason that our reaction worked so well is because the graphene is helping out with the photocatalytic behavior. Great. So, no more questions?